Chapter fifty one of History of the World War by Francis March and Richard Beamish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter fifty one Approaching the Final Stage. The might and pride of Germany were smashed and humbled by folk in frontal attacks divided roughly into three great sectors. The first of these attacks was delivered by the French and Americans in the southern sector, which included Verdun and the Argonne. The second smash was delivered by British, French, and Americans in the Cambrai sector. The third was delivered by British, Belgians, French, and Americans in the Belgian sector on the north of the Great Battle Line. The Cambrai operation had as its first objective the possession of the strategic railways, both of which ran from Valencia's, one to the huge distribution center at Douai, the other to Cambrai itself. To reach these objectives, the Allies were obliged to cross the Sensi and Escot canals under infantry and artillery fire. Besides these natural obstacles, there was the famous Hunding line of fortifications erected by the Germans between the Scarpe and the Oise River. The attack was opened in force on September 18, 1918, by the 4th British Army under General Rawlinson and the 1st French Army under General de Bigny. The assault was successful northwest of St. Quentin, and determined German counterattacks were broken down by French and British artillery fire. The 3rd British Army, under General Bing, and the 30th American Division cooperating with the 1st British Army under Sir Henry Horne, attacked furiously over a 14-mile front toward Cambrai. The net result of this operation was the possession of the Canal du Nord, the taking of several villages, and 6,000 prisoners. This was on September 27th. The following day the same forces captured Fontaine Notre Dame, Marcoin, Noyala, and Cantiang. More than two hundred guns were captured and ten thousand prisoners. On september twenty ninth the Americans took Bellecourt and Noroy, and invested the suburbs of Cambrai. The British crossed the Escout Canal, and the Canadians penetrated some of the environs of Cambrai. The resolution and ferocity of the attack thoroughly dismayed the Germans, and the salient produced by the smash forced the Teutons to evacuate the greatly prized Lens coal fields on October 3rd. Horn and Bing continued their advance, the former occupying Bianche St. Vast, southwest of Douai, and the latter reaching a position five miles northwest of Cambrai. Caught between the jaws of the pincers, the German forces occupying Cambrai made haste to escape outright capture. The city that had been the objective of British hopes and thrusts for two years fell into the hands of the Allies. The German retreat extended over a thirty-mile front and included both St. Quentin and Cambrai. Simultaneously, the German forces between Arras and St. Quentin fell steadily backward. Le Chateau and Zazuel fell into the hands of the British October 17th, three thousand prisoners and a quantity of war material being included in the bag. In the meantime, General Mangan, attacking in the Leon sector, drove the Germans from the strategic Kemen de Dam, and with General Bertelot captured Beria Bock, the St. Gobain Mastiff, and completed contact with Generals Pershing and Garod on the right and with Generals Rawlinson and de Benet on the left. The Allied advance now became a huge steel broom, sweeping the Germans irresistibly before it. The operation extended from the Ouise southwest to the Aisne, broadening thence until it included the entire front. The Hindenburg Line, the Somme Battlefield, the Hunding Line were all quickly overrun. The fortress of Maubourg, fifty miles northwest of St. Quentin, which was connected with that city by a triple railway connection, was evacuated as a direct result of this operation. When St. Quentin itself fell into the hands of de Bonnet, it was found that the Germans had deported the entire civil population of 50,000. This was the crux of the operations by Folk. Germans were given no rest. Night and day the pressure continued. Every clash showed the increasing superiority of the Allies both in men and material, and the corresponding deterioration of the German forces. This demoralization of the Germans extended from the high command to the private soldier. Prisoners poured into the hands of the Allies. Evacuation of Lille was commenced on October 2nd, and Robier and Turcoing also fell. It was the beginning of Germany's military debacle. The time was ripe for the coup de grace soon to be delivered by Americans cooperating with the Allies on a 71-mile front. The Kaiser, 
Ludendorff and von Hindenburg abandoned hope. The command went forth from the German general headquarters to retreat, 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 while Prince Maximilian of Baden appealed to America for an armistice. The sword in Germany's hand was broken. Autocracy, defeated in the eyes of its deluded subjects and discredited in the eyes of the world, was in headlong flight. Its only concern was to save as much as possible from the ruins of the ostentatious temple it had reared. End of chapter 51